All right, thanks very much, Antonia, for the introduction. And thanks very much to the local organizers for the invitation. Uh, it doesn't happen very often that I fly twice in the same month uh, from Los Angeles to the same city in Europe after a, part, after a comp class at the beginning of September. This is the second time here at UPC and at Thimna, and it's a great pleasure to be, to be back here. So thanks very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor. And while I'm thinking, I would also like to thank my co-authors, Ishan Timbekar as a grad student in my group, uh, Jeff Aimling just graduated from my group this summer, and Gabriella uh, Venturini was a postdoc in my group. And together we've worked on cross-grain atomistics, and that's what I would like to talk about today. So atomistics, in a nutshell, and I'm sure most of us know exactly what that is, is a particle method at its best. It's extremely simple because the only thing we have to deal with is atomic positions. So we have the positions of the particles, you have their velocities, you can use an implicit or explicit integration scheme, and the governing equation is as trivial as can be. There's a Hamiltonian, there's kinetic energy, there's potential energy, there's no friction or anything in between. So the governing equation is as simple as can be, namely F equals MA, and the force is obtained from the interactions in between particles. And this is what we do for atomistics. We can minimize the energy that gives us equilibrium states, or we use explicit or implicit time integration that gives us the evolution of a system. And this has been used for a variety of systems. This just shows some, ex uh, some examples of what we look at from void growth over wave propagation and shock physics to dislocation interactions, and this is a, an extremely well-established method. So what you, can you still do? One of the key limitations of atomistics is computational power, and I'm very grateful that um, uh, Petros Komutakis yesterday gave a talk where he highlighted this, among others, and the problem is that our computational resources are limited. So if you talk about atomistics, that means if we just think about the memory consumption, each particle has three degrees of freedom, right? It has three velocities on top of that, and there's some computational overhead. And so if we look at what our computers, our supercomputers super can do nowadays, and this is a brief review of what was possible from 2013 to today, basically, of course our computer power has accelerated dramatically. I mean, the number of particles or of atoms that we can simulate has grown dramatically. Uh, Petros just yesterday uh, showed in his talk that he's able to simulate 10 to the 13 particles. That's a lot. The problem is that even if you look in the future, and this is a prediction that comes from the U.S. Department of Energy and its, its exascale initiative, even in the future, our systems, they will go bigger, but they will not go much bigger. So even if we can do 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 particles or atoms, what does this buy us? Well, just for a comparison, if you take a cube of the side length one millimeter and you want to model that, that requires you to model about 10 to the 20 atoms. So we're still orders of magnitude away from what you can do with the biggest computers on Earth. And the second problem is that even though our computers get bigger and bigger, they don't get much faster. So in MD, we have a time step of one femtosecond, which means the most we can model if you don't want your grandsons to see the results one day is we can maybe do a microsecond or so of simulation time. So we're heavily constrained and that means we need methods to bridge across scale, methods to go from nano to macro scale. And that's exactly what I'd like to talk about here. So whenever you go from small to large and vice versa, there's two general ways how we can do it. Way number one is you can patch, you can combine different techniques. And many people have done this. This is just one famous example where you look at a crack and ahead of the crack, that's the reason, region where I want highest accuracy, I use something like tight binding, which is first principles based. Away from the crack, I use molecular dynamics or MD. And then even further away, I use finite elements. This is a very nice scheme. You can go to bigger scales with this. The issues are that, number one, you need to patch these two models together. How exactly do you do that? What do you do at the boundary? How do you make sure that your finite element actually is the same material as the MD? How do you get these together? And number two is I need to know exactly where I need the high resolution. What happens if the crack propagates? How, how do I do this? And so way number two, and this is what I'd like to talk about, is coarsening. And the advantages, as we'll see in the next couple of slides, is number one, I don't need a coarse continuum description. I will use atomistic potentials only, no elasticity, plasticity whatsoever. And number two is there will be a seamless transition. I can go from full atomistics to the continuum without having to do strange interfaces or things in the middle. Now, how does this work? So what I'll talk about, and this at the same time is pretty much the outline of my talk, is first, how do we spatially coarse grain? How, go we, how do we go from zillions of particles to just a few? What do we have to do theoretically to still calculate forces correctly and so forth? Then there is a number of computational aspects that I'll talk about, especially the automatic model adaptation, which is very tricky. And then I'll show some examples of what we can do with this. And depending on time, I'll also talk about upscaling and time. <clears throat> 
So let's get started. The basis of, of what I'm talking about here is the idea that was originally called the quasi-continuum method, and the idea is extremely simple. I'm mainly focusing on metals here, and so many of you at this point will get bored or not interested anymore, because atoms and metals have something very, very nice. They have order. I don't consider completely random atoms or particles. I consider ordered crystalline solids. And so if this here is my atomic crystal and the gray dots are atoms, what we do is, is a very simple trick. We say wherever we need full atomistic resolution, for example, around a defect, at a crack, at a grain boundary, I take all the atoms into account. As I go away from that region, I only take every nth atom into account. I coarse them. I only take those atoms that I really want, and I call these the representative atoms, or wrap atoms. And what we do in between is we use some kind of interpolation. I'll talk about this later on, because I still need to know where all the, guys, the gray guys are moving, and I'll use an interpolation to find out where exactly they're moving. And this can be done in many ways. Once you do this, your entire description now depends only on the positions and velocities of the red points of the wrap atoms. The gray ones have disappeared, and there are no longer degrees of freedom in your system, so you have greatly reduced the number of degrees of freedom from all the atoms to only a small number of atoms. Now, this doesn't solve the problem entirely, so let's look at how this could be done. One way you could do it, the simplest possible, actually, is to use linear interpolation. If you use linear interpolation in between these dots, that means you construct a mesh. You go from a particle method to a mesh-based method, use an interpolation in between, and now we know where all the atoms are going. Advantages are it's really simple, and we can also use standard things like quadrature and so forth. So what this means, just in two steps, is first we pick all those representative particles that we're interested in. The second thing we have to do is we still need to compute the energy and the forces in the system. And so instead of summing over all those guys, we need to be a bit more careful about that. So what we could do is, of course, this looks like finite elements, so why don't we do something that we know from finite elements? We do something like quadrature. I could, for example, compute the energy of these nodes plus something at the center or wherever I pick these points. I compute their energy, I give them a weight, I sum them up, and I assume that this is representative for the entire crystal. It's an assumption. Now, where do you put those points and how do you choose the weights? That's the big challenge. People have done this for a while, and here are some references. For example, you could take just one point at the center of the element. That's what's known as the cauchy born rule. You could use the nodes themselves. You could use the nodes plus quadrature points. That's very similar to the stress point integration in the SPH method. You could put clusters around your nodes. There's many ways how you could do it. In every way, you're approximating the energy. And once we have the approximated energy, it can compute forces. Forces on the nodes, which is nothing else but the derivative of the approximated energy with respect to the positions of the nodes. Right? So I again have a particle method in the sense that I have particles flying around. It's now the nodes. I have forces on them. I can integrate in time, and I'm happy. The problem is, and this has been known for a while, that if you do this, there's something that we call force artifacts. And these are problematic. And the story behind them, it's complicated, but can be put in a nutshell like this. If I do not consider the energy of every atom, but only the energy of, let's say, three atoms, then, of course, I could come up with a state of deformation where these three atoms have very low energy, but everything in between is completely messed up. I'm just not considering everything in between anymore. And so based on this, the system could artificially find minimum energy states which are normally not there. This becomes apparent if you run simple tests. So this is an example that we ran here. We take a cube, and at the center is a very tiny void. There's a nano void, there's full resolution around the void, and now we coarse and as we go away. What we do is we pull on the sample elastically in a nice regime, and we check for the position and the energy of each of the atoms, and we compare this to full atomistics. If I sum only over the nodes, then this is the error, and this is the energy error and the displacement error shown here in color code. If I make clusters around the nodes, it looks like this. If I use first order quadrature, second order quadrature, of course, the more sampling points you throw in, the better you get. You reduce the error, but the error is still huge. It's on the order of an angstrom or so. The interatomic spacing for reference is on the order of three angstroms or so. So our atoms are really where they're not supposed to be. Luckily, the linear affine interpolation comes with a trick that we can use to overcome that. We can be smart about how we sum the energy. We don't have to use Fe quadrature. It actually makes no sense here. Because if we look at a large element as shown over here and we consider the energy of, of all those points, well, energy in atomistics depends on where your neighbors are, just like in any particle method. And so if we use a linear interpolation, that's the simplest case possible, what does that mean? Linear interpolation means we have a constant stress, uh, strain gradient or a constant strain inside the element. 
As a consequence, all of these points on the inside are deforming affinely with whatever your nodes are doing. And what that means is that each of those points inside the element sees the exact same neighborhood, and so it also experiences the exact same energy. In other words, all of these white dots here, if this, for example, is the sphere of interaction, experience the exact same energy, and the same forces, and so forth. So why not pick one of those guys, and the weight would be nothing else but the sum over all these white points, and that's how we would represent all those guys at the center. As we go towards the boundary and the nodes, of course, the energy changes, because now my particles are reaching into adjacent elements. The adjacent elements have a different strain state, so the energy changes. And you can see this nicely in simulations. If these are my elements, and this is color-coded by energy per atom, we can see that inside elements, the energy is pretty much constant. As you go towards the boundary and the nodes, the energy changes, because this is when your particles reach into the adjacent elements. So the way out of this, and this is how we do it normally, I'll just abbreviate this here. We have one sampling atom at the center. This takes into account the energy on the inside. We take the nodes as sampling atoms. I'll talk about this later on. This is very important. And we'll have additional ones on the faces. And these account for the fact how the energy varies. Namely, on the inside, it's constant. On the faces, it's different. And at the nodes, it's yet different again. The beauty of this is that if I shrink my elements and I make them smaller and smaller, what happens is ultimately when these circles here tend to overlap, these nodes just disappear. So the element looks like this. If I make it even smaller, eventually this guy disappears, and I get down here. And this is nothing else but the atomistic limit. Every atom has degrees of freedom, and I'm summing over all the atoms. So if I just make my elements small enough, I recover atomistics in its, its original way. There's no approximation anymore. Okay, so that's, that's one way to do it. If we now compare again, that's the same picture I showed you before, and this is what happens if we use our new summation rule, and you can see that the, or, the, the errors are literally vanished, more or less, because we are smart about how we compute the energy. Of course, you can also do things in a different way, and that's what I'd like to show here as well. We've also played with meshless ways, because in principle, what we did is we started with particles, and we turned them into a finite element problem. If you don't like finite element problems, we can do it differently as well. The only thing we have to do is replace the interpolation by something that does not introduce finite elements. So we could use a meshless method, and the one that we used here is called local uh, maximum entropy uh, approximation scheme. It was developed by Michael Ortiz and Marino Arroyo. Uh, Marino is actually here at UPC now. And this scheme has a very nice feature for anybody interested in meshless methods, and that is it tries to find an optimum between what we call locality and entropy. Locality means what's the support of your shape functions. If we minimize locality, that means your shape functions are as small as possible. The region in which they are non-zero is as small as possible. So if I minimize locality, what that means is I basically get back to my linear affine shape functions, which are only defined in the adjacent elements and nowhere else. Fine. What I can do, on the other hand, is to introduce the entropy of my shape functions. Shape functions are between zero and one, and they always sum up to one. That's exactly the same as a probability distribution. So in the sense of Jane's, one could define an entropy of your shape function. And now if you maximize the entropy, what that means is you come up with shape functions. They look like little Gaussians, but they are least biased towards the location of your nodes. That might be much better. And so what these guys came up with is a combination of the two. They tried to minimize the locality and at the same time maximize entropy. And this beta is a tuning factor in between. So if we make this beta really, really large, that means the locality is dominant, and we get our linear shape functions. If beta is very small, the entropy dominates, and we get these Gaussians. You can use this beta to tweak your shape functions. Do you want them affine, or do you want these Gaussians that are floating wherever you want? One can actually solve this and go through it. The only problem is, ultimately, the shape functions cannot be derived analytically. One has to compute them numerically, and that's a computational issue because it's expensive. The benefit is, and this is shown over here, by spatially changing the beta value, or gamma is nothing else but beta times the, the spacing of your nodes, we can change the shape functions however we want. For example, we can have these Gaussians on the inside, but if we want atomistics, that's quite important. If I go to the atomistic limit, I want my shape functions to be linear shape functions. They have to be one at the node and zero at the other nodes, because otherwise I'm not solving f equals ma, I'm solving something else. And so these shape functions allow us to do that. They look like this. I can make them affine if I want. I can turn them into Gaussians if I want. And this beta parameter is all I have to control. 
Another nice benefit of these shape functions is they satisfy what's known as a weak Kronecker property. For anyone interested in fluid structure interactions or the like, these shape functions are very nice because of their property. What this means is only nodes which are on the boundary contribute on the boundary. You never get any contributions from inside nodes to the boundary, and that's a very important characteristic for fluid structure interactions or if you want to apply boundary conditions in general. So we can do the same thing here. We just use this interpolation in our QC framework. Instead of using a linear interpolation, I use the meshless one, meshless one. Now, the summation rule that I showed you before, we're trying to be careful about one node at the center and some on the edges doesn't work anymore because I don't have a constant strain inside the element. So what we would do here instead is just do stress point integration. So we create some background mesh, and now you sum over the nodes and the center. And now you can run some simulations with this. And what's now very nice is that the accuracy depends not only on where you put your red nodes, your wrap atoms, it only depends on how you choose this beta parameter, how wide you make your shape functions. And we can actually show, we did some indentation tests, some expansion tests, that the error in these simulations depends on your choice of beta. So if you make these meshless shape functions to be of a, second, uh, of, of a certain support size, you can minimize the error, and that's very nice. The issue is, of course, number one, they're computationally expensive. And number two, there's a big problem with mesh or model adaptation, and that's what I'd like to show you on the next slide. Because one of the nice things that we've done here is we coarsened the mesh in a seamless, uh, sorry, the lattice, the crystal, in a seamless way. Meaning, as I showed you before, if we fully refine, if we turn all the nodes into wrap atoms and sampling atoms, we recover atomistics. So what I mean by this is, the beauty is that it can be fully adaptive. If I run a simulation, for example, of nano indentation, there's a pyramidal indenter coming into your crystal. I don't want to know at the beginning where exactly I will need atomistic resolution later. There will be dislocations that are running into the crystal, and I want to fully refine them with atomistics. I don't want atomistics back here where nothing is happening. So I want this to be fully adaptive and fully automatic. In order to do this, I need to be able to refine this down to atomistics. So if I make my elements the smallest possible, I should recover atomistics. And what that means as a consequence is I must make sure that each and every node, each and every vertex that I put into this mesh must be a lattice side. If I don't do that, I have a problem because if I go down to atomistics, I recover just about anything but the perfect crystal. And that's a very constraining fact that's computationally extremely difficult. Now, remeshing for us means we need a criterion. You can do this element-wise or node-wise. You just check if you need refinement. Is something happening? Is your deformation gradient very large, or is the center of symmetry of your particle very high? And then we need a refinement algorithm. For example, you can bisect your longest edge in each element and go from there. So let me show you in a few movies how this works in practice. This is the example of a spherical nanoindenter coming in from the top. We start with a very coarse system. And at some point, of course, you trigger dislocation activity. What you see here in red are dislocations that are flying into the solid. Let me just play it one more time. Over here, you can see how the mesh is refined. Here, you see the sampling atoms as the refinement occurs. And down here, you see where wrap atoms are being put. And this is just a zoom in. And so you can nicely see that at the beginning, we don't need to know anything about the sample. But as soon as dislocations run, the mesh automatically tracks them down. And even if it runs into uh, coarse regions, it just fully refines, and you can track down what happens. So I think on the next slide, this is a movie of a slightly different indenter. So it takes longer to nuclear dislocations, dislocations, uh, dislocations they come in pairs. But again, we track down what happens, and so you can do it fully adaptively. And the beauty is there is no interface, right? I don't have atomistics over here and the continuum over there. We, we don't have that. This is fully adaptive, and the model itself does not need to know where it needs full resolution and where it doesn't. There's one other thing uh, that's, that's quite tricky here, and that is we do work with a mesh, right? We have the mesh, even if we have full atomistics, because if I refine fully down to the atomistic level, I still have that mesh. And so very funny things happen because of this. Well, I, I know I use the word funny in a, in a loose way, but I, I find it interesting. So what I'm showing here is full resolution here, coarsened away from this, this, this region, and I'm again indenting with a, a spherical indenter. And what we'll look at is we'll look at one atom, which is somewhere down here, and as the indenter comes in, the neighborhood of this atom will change, of course. Atoms, particles are messed around, they're moving, and as a consequence of this, the neighbors of my particle will change. In the deformed configuration, this is where most of us live. That's very easy. All I do is I track my nearest neighbors. 
when I have a mesh in the background, that becomes very interesting because now out of a sudden this guy here has neighbors that were not neighbors in the undefined configuration. So if I play the movie, what we'll see is that the neighborhood here is just being remapped over and over and over again because we find new neighbors. But what that means is that ultimately this gentleman down here is now interacting with atoms all across the original mesh. So the mesh really loses its meaning. It doesn't mean much anymore. There's no, no notion of nearest atoms stay nearest. We have to do this remeshing all the time, but that's a cost that one has to pay. So even here, even though we have a mesh, we have to find the neighbors over and over again. We have to extend how many neighbors we include because we have that mesh. That's the cost we have to pay. Of course, the benefit is that now it's fully adaptive. I don't have atomistic region and continuum region. It's just all the same. Um, in the interest of time, I'll go over, over this rather quickly. But in principle, everything you've seen so far, for those who are experts in atomistics, has been at zero or very low temperature. There were no fluctuations of your atoms. I assume they're in a perfect crystalline state. You can actually get temperature into these simulations. One way to do this is the so-called maximum entropy approach that Michael Ortiz and, 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 and team developed, probably first shown in the PhD thesis of Yashko Karni, um, and recently published also by Gabriella Venturini and co-workers uh, uh, and, and colleagues. And the idea here is that you replace the atomic potential by an effective potential, and this effective potential depends on entropy, uh, depends on, I'm sorry, on temperature. And so this is not done in a hoc way, but you can actually write this down in the framework of statistical mechanics. And the idea is you maximize the entropy, and you can arrive at this potential in closed form. So our interatomic potential now depends not only on the mean motion of your atoms, but every atom additionally has a degree of freedom, which is the thermal vibration of the atom. And so our atoms now depend on position, and momentum, if you will, and this vibrational frequency. And we can solve for both the mean motion and the vibrational frequency. And by doing this, you can also add temperature onto the coarse grain framework that I showed you previously. So that the bottom line here is whatever I showed you works only at zero or very low temperature, true. But all of these temporal upscaling techniques that exist can be just brought on top of that. It's not exclusive in no way. We can use spatial coarsening and temporal upscaling in the very same way. These are not exclusive at all. So what I've showed you so far is that as a first step towards this, this spatially coarsened uh, uh, atomistic technique, what we've done is we got rid of very many atoms. We just picked our favorite ones, the wrap atoms, and we equipped those with degrees of freedom. In the second step, what we did is we talked about reducing the ensemble. We don't have to sum over all the atoms, but just like quarter transfer elements, we introduced a very particular scheme to compute forces and energies. Then I showed you how we do the adaptivity, how we can do it seamlessly so we go from atomistics to the continuum, and this can be in a seamless way. There's no patching of two methods. And I very briefly, admittedly, showed you how we can also do things in time, but that's not my focus here. So let me show just one example here of, of a nano-indentation test now in full beauty. Um, we're just punching in with a spherical indenter. This is a fairly large one, the order of 100 nanometers or so. The top is just the view. This is really the top view. What you see down here is zoomed in from below, and what I'm highlighting is only those atoms that have high center symmetry. So only those atoms that participate in dislocations or other defects. So of course you can argue the number of particles down here is fairly small because you don't really see many. But the truth is I'm only showing you the interesting ones. The reality is that we have millions of particles underneath the surface. And that becomes apparent maybe when I go to the next slide where you can see the entire cube that is modeled over here. The dislocations are forming up here, but the cube of course is much bigger. And by using this coarsening, I have full resolution at the top, but I don't need the full resolution at the bottom. So I can go to much bigger volumes than what I could do if I were to treat each and every particle individually. So it's a way to really get, gain efficiency. And you can do your favorite simulations that you would do with lamps or something else. This is nano indentation with a spherical indenter, with a pyramidal indenter. You see typical size effects or shape effects, and all of these things which you can do with atomistics, we can do here as well. Just that we don't need each and every particle. All I do is have full resolution where I need it, just like I showed you, and the rest is coarsened. You can apply this to many different things. Um, I don't show you all the examples, but we've looked at size effects, for example, in thin sheets that have holes and dents or cracks, and we looked at dislocation propagation away from the hole, and of course, again, you have to refine as the dislocations move. We've looked at void growth, which is an interesting thing uh, because it's the precursor for spall or ductile failure. 
We've also looked at grain boundaries, and this is just one example where you're indenting from the top, you have dislocations moving towards the grain boundary, then there's an interaction with the grain boundary. In order to model this, we need a large 3D system. And what we do is everything down here and everything where we don't need it is coarsened. So again, we can go to much bigger volumes. Um, just one quick comment in, in response to oh, talk. In, in, in response to, to Petras Komotsakis' talk as well, he made a very interesting point, which I'd like to stress here as well. And that is what we very often do in um, mechanics is we develop our favorite model. And then we go to our favorite computational scientist and we say, go make it fast. And what would usually is the case is at that point is too late already. Because what we learned from this whole exercise when we wrote the code and we started from scratch is the best thing you can do is before you do anything, before you write a single line of code, to carefully think about what exactly is the right way to do things to speed things up. And that's exactly how you can get these super high uh, peak values on the big machines. And so, for example, in our case, there are simple questions like how do you store your atoms? Let's say you have the position of 20 million atoms. How do you store these positions in memory? Just randomly organize them by X coordinate, Z coordinate, Y coordinate, or whatnot. If you make this decision wisely, you can get a huge speed up just by how you store them. It sounds ridiculous, but it's something that you can consider. How do we search for neighbors? How do we sort the neighbors? How do we store them in memory? How do we compute distances between particles and so forth? There's many things we can do, and by just going through this exercise, and Jeff Aimling did all this, we reached uh, uh, to, to speed ups on the order of 50 to 60 times, and this is all on a single core. This is before parallelization. On top of this, we can do threading. On top of this, we can do MPI parallel. There's many things one can do. The important thing is we really need to work with our computational science friends here, or like in my case, be very lucky to have a student whose hobby is high-performance computing, and in that case, it works naturally. Um, but this really matters, and this is what brings the huge speed up and what, what makes this beautiful in the big machines. So the last comment I'd like to make, and then I'll conclude, is that what I've showed you here is a technique that, of course, is not limited to atomistics. As long as you give me a system of nodes, be it particles, be it something else, that are interacting through a well-defined potential, I can use this. So we talked about atomistics. We've done the very same thing for trusses, for example. I can take the nodes of a truss network. They have positions. They might have rotations if there are beams. If I know what the interaction is, for example, the elastic energy of a beam in between two nodes, I can apply the exact same framework. I have full resolution where I need it, for example, near a crack in a three-point bending test, and of course, as I go away. And so, again, you achieve much higher efficiency because I only retain full resolution down here, but I have a very natural continuum approximation. I don't need any continuum law. It comes out naturally. And so as something, oh, I hope you can see the picture, that I'm very curious about here at this conference, I've actually learned a lot, is in principle you could use the same for DEM, for any particle method, as long as your particles are ordered and as long as we understand the interactions very well. We've done this, for example, for, this is hard, very hard to see, but this is a picture from an experiment that we did in our lab where we have black acrylic particles, spherical perfect particles, between two glass sheets. And you can actually see that very many of the phenomena you see in atomistics, you see in this uh, scenario as well. We see, well, you don't see, but I would see, uh, vacancies, dislocations, grain boundaries, all kinds of things, if it's an ordered system. So if you have ordered particles and you know what the interactions are, chances are very large we can use the exact same framework, and it makes it much more efficient. So if anybody has great ideas of what we can target with this, let me know afterwards. And with this, I've come to the end. Just to conclude in two sentences, I tried to show you how we can go from atomistics to bigger scales by spatial coarsening of the particle system. We have to be smart about how to sum the energy. We can do everything adaptively if we do it the right way. We can go to finite temperature if you want to do atomistics. I showed you results for a number of nanoscale systems, but also how we can extend this to many particle-like systems, including trusses, ordered particles, and whatnot. If you're interested, there's a few references down here, and otherwise, I'll be very happy to take questions or comments. Thanks very much. <clears throat>